So a little bit about me, not that you really care, but I've been around for doing packets and looking at trace files 30 years. I mean, since 19, on, somewhere in there. It's been a long time. So this is my company, mnex.biz. You're welcome to go out to my website. I encourage you, as a matter of fact, go, to go download the frame header spreadsheet. I'm gonna introduce it to you real quick, and I'm not here to sell you anything, even though I sound like a used car salesman. Yeah, I'm really not. I'm not here to sell you anything. What I'm here is to show you resources. So I did not, I cannot take credit for this. A friend of mine put this together uh, as part of a CISSP project years ago. I keep it updated. So he started it eh, a long time ago, 10, 12 years ago. And I keep adding things to it as I, as I need those resources. I figure you as well as network folks, security folks, need these same resources. So I'm not going to go all the way through this, but you see, we start with the frame information and we go all the way along the bottom, TCP dump, Unix commands, ngrep, nmap. I don't know. You guys ever heard of nmap? Gals, I got to be politically correct. Okay. Keep going over to the, to the right there. Nessus, Netcat, OS fingerprinting, dump camp, Edicamp, Wireshark, FTP, HTTP, all these wonderful protocols. You got all this great information now at your fingertips. I don't know, anybody doing voice over IP troubleshooting today need to do any of that? Looking at any of that from a security perspective as well? All that information is in this spreadsheet. So I highly encourage you to go out there and grab that. Number two, I got a lot of videos. I'm kind of into doing videos and free training. Do you hear that? Free training. Free is good these days, isn't it? A lot of free training classes take you from physical layer up to the application, troubleshooting, doing labs with Wireshark. How many of you have Wireshark? Come on, every and in your ought to go up, right? It's free. We're back to that's the right price. How many of you know how to use Wireshark? What's all this? I mean, come on now. So, okay, I'm not going to teach you how to use Wireshark today. I'm going to show you a couple of things that we can do using Wireshark in an effort to secure your company's assets. Maybe if I can find my presentation again. Nah, this computer stuff, it's gonna catch on someday. There it is. Okay, so we know there are bad actors out there trying to break into your network. We've, I've heard about security stuff. You've heard about security stuff. You need to start monitoring your network today. If you're not, I'm gonna say right there. So just looking at mine, my worldwide headquarters of MNEX based out of Kansas City, one day, one day, 241 attempts made to get into my network from US companies, dirty dogs. And we keep hearing on the news, right? Russia, China, really. The second one's Canada, eh? I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> Taiwan and then China, I don't even see Russia. I guess I'm not, they don't want anything out of my network. That's okay by me. So the Boy Scout motto, be prepared. This is the whole thing. You need to be prepared in order to gain total network visibility. You need to capture all of the packets, if possible. Know the normal path of your packets. So we want to be on the internet side. We want to be on any VPN interfaces, any, any interfaces coming into your corporate environment. You know, we've heard about all the different companies being hacked over the last, uh, you know, pick the years, right? Started with Target. Somebody said that already this morning. Uh, Verizon, 14 million records. You know, come on, it's happening every day. So gather the log files from your firewalls, servers, IDS. How many of you uh, know how to use Snort and have Snort? Again, it's a What's all this? I mean, it's free. Everybody keeps saying I want free. It's a free IDS. You should at least be using that as well. So the cost of information, why do they want in? The value of your information. I can't 100%, you know, validate this. I got this from someone else's presentation that I took a picture of 
And I said, ooh, that's kind of good information. So here you go. What this information is worth and why they want to get in, according to that security professional in a previous one of these, emails worth 129 bucks. Credit cards, there's not a lot of value to that because of all the anti-fraud, all that, and everybody's watching. Payment accounts, your health record. Now that kind of, I get that because I do a lot of work with uh, some hospitals in Kansas City. Do you know how hard it would be to change your health record once they got that? Oh my gosh, it'll be brutal. So that's why that's kind of a, that's worth a lot of money if they can get your health record information. Social security number, bank account information, airline miles. I never even thought about airline miles. How many of you got the million mile account? You don't travel enough, huh? Your low paid jobs as a sock analyst. <laughs> I'm kidding. So, okay, the 20 SANS, critical security controls. This is where packets, I'm not here to educate you on any of this. I'm here to talk to you about packets because that's the world I live in every day. And packets fall into CSC9, critical security control number nine. You old folks, Beatles, number nine, number nine, number nine. And number 11, those are the two places packets pay us, play a strategic role into your security infrastructure. Again, why is it important? The cost of the attacks, the mitigation, investigation, monitoring, all of that, security controls, that costs corporations money. I can't even remember his name. Ben said it best earlier. HIPAA, we've talked about someone here was already in the HIPAA side of things. You know, we just saw that here recently. Uh, Anthem was, was fined $115 million for their data breach. It starts to cost you big money. And, you know, the HIPAA violations are anywhere from 100 bucks a record that goes out to $5,000 a record that goes out. You know, you can't really afford a couple hundred thousand records leaving your environment or a million records leaving your environment. So the question I get asked most often is, how do I get the packets out of the network? You all familiar with setting up SPAN? I know that's you not, you know, network folks necessarily, but you know how to set up a SPAN port? Yes, perfect. Or you have a tap. That's the, that's the ways that we get packets out of our environment to be able to, to capture that information and then run some filters, some pretty simple filters to, to vindicate or validate those signatures. I encourage you to monitor both inside and outside the firewall. It's always good to look at the outside to see, you know, who's trying to break in. And obviously on the inside, who got in? No magic there. Jethro Math, right? The Gazendas Gazaudis. So we want to monitor any other inbound, outbound link, VPN, branch, office, branch tunnel you got. Someone had already mentioned GRE tunneling. <laughs> you know, most firewalls allow that stuff through. Your key locations need to be monitored for attacks. And again, you want to look for both inside and outside threats. Man, I can't stress the first. The top thing right there, know your environment. No consultant knows your environment. Nobody else knows your environment, nor are they going to learn it. So again, know it from outside, from inside, all your hosts. You know, what defenses do you currently have in place? DLP, IPDS, IDS, uh, PCAPs, are you taking captures with that free Wireshark tool? How many of you know how to use T-Shark? Wow, really? Okay, T-Shark is another free utility that you can set up. Let me introduce you. Did I introduce you to my spreadsheet yet? You want to build a capture box that will capture all these packets for you for guess how much? Free. That's a great number, isn't it? Free. It's not even $49, it's free. <laughs> uh, so I passed it again. I'll learn how to use a computer. So if we go back over here to T-Shark, I gave you this little batch file that you could, how many of you remember how to do a batch file? Oh, okay, there's a few, sweet. Here's a little batch file that you can run right there that will actually copy, create a whole bunch of capture files for you. In this case, I got to look at it. And it's just a matter of changing a couple of these parameters. In this case, it's going to create 250 files of 100 meg in size and write them 
to a folder called traces. Now, hey, it's a batch file. You already raised your hand, right? You can change it. All right, so you can make it as many as you'd like. And now you have a free, how much is it? Free, free capture device that you can now start capturing both inside and outside. And you know, this doesn't take a lot of horsepower. You got some old 286s laying around. I'm kidding. Hopefully you got better than that laying around. And again, the question you got to ask yourself is, do you filter? Do I just want to see, you know, the first 128 bytes of the frame? Just do, I, just do I need protocol information or do I need the entire payload? And kind of like Smokey, the bear, only you can prevent forest fires. So only you can answer that question. My personal opinion, in $5, you can get a cup of coffee at uh, Starbucks. So my personal opinion is you need the entire packet. And the reason being is I need all that application information, URL information, all of that stuff that's in the payload of the packet. But it's always a trade-off, right? If, if I've got so big of a size of storage, do I, do I want more frames with less application information or do I want less frames with all the information? So again, only you can prevent forest fires. Me and Johnny Dare. All right, so create your monitoring methodology. What do you want to monitor? What are you looking for in the packets? I've heard it from all of these speakers today, data exfiltration. It's kind of key. If there's stuff leaving your environment and it's not going to a site that it's supposed to be going to, wow, I can't even do it. The Elvis eyebrow thing. You should raise the Elvis eyebrow and take a look at why 11 gig file just left your network. Web attacks, spear phishing, whale phishing, wanting to get all the big dogs, host infections, DNS. People are creatures of habit. It's funny to come into our office in the morning and look and see where everybody's going for .com. I'm, I'm kidding. Maybe you are, maybe you aren't. But people are always creatures of habits, and you just start tracking, and all of a sudden you look for the anomalies of, wait a second, they didn't go to Ford.com this morning. They went to three other different places that they've never been to before. So it's just a way for you to come up with what are the indicators, and then you need to execute on your plan. What are your indicators? What are the value of those indicators? And then you need to prioritize the value. So I'm just going to give you a couple. You can probably come up with your own as well. But here you see an email server has initiated an outbound FTP session. Again, I can't do the Elvis eyebrow thing, but that would be an indicator to a host in Russia. Maybe if you're Donald Trump, that might. I did not say that out loud. You did not hear that. That's on tape, isn't it? <laughs> I'm going down. I'll be audited next year. You see a spike in, in, in the amount of internet control message protocol traffic at two in the morning. Again, you know, ICMP routers send ICMP traffic to notify us of issues, but it could be. Something to your firewall. I don't know. We probably need to look at that in more detail. You see a host sending zip or RAR packaged files to a host in San Diego. Is that a problem? I don't know. You got a, you got a site in San Diego? Jack Henry, you got a site in San Diego? If you do, that's probably good. I'd still check out, you know, what is it talking to? So these are the things that you need to be paying attention to and that you can easily build filters for. Trojans and worms. I've heard all this malware stuff that we've talked about today. Trojans and worms. They've been around for a long time. Have you thought about it from the network's perspective? Anybody? How many of you know how to start a connection in TCP? What, what frames have to happen? Sin, Senac, and an act. Three frames, right? So Trojans and worms try to talk to the world from inside and do lateral movement. So a very simple filter would be to look for sinks and sync acts. So if I filter for sinks and I get a thousand, how many sync acts should I get? That would be good if it's one to one, right? 
but what if I only got a hundred sync acts, but I got a thousand syncs? Just saying, might be an indicator. You see how we're, we're taking this? Now, the next step of this question, and I'm more than willing to show you how to do it. How many of you could build that filter in Wireshark? <sighs> Two, three, five? That's what Google's for. There you go. How about if I just show you? We'll just get it over with. It's really fast. I got Wireshark running. TCP dump, we can do it there too. How about tcp.flags.sin equals equals one. And it turns green. That's a great thing in Wireshark, by the way. If you're typing in your filter and it's red, eh, thanks for playing. So make sure it's green, TCP dot flags dot sin equals equals one. That'll give you the number of sinks, you know, and there we go. And then the other one is just, and what do you think that might be? If I want to find my sink ax and TCP dot flags, oh, look out, dots, and it's even kind of there for you. Dot ack, and you can kind of scroll down, check that out. Equals equals one. Uh, I don't actually. I don't want that one. Look, oh, that's not what I want. I want sinks and sinks I sink axe. So there's our sinks. Cool enough. Google. If you don't know, Google. But easy filters, some very easy filters. Now, how many of you have heard of the other tool, my favorite tool, Observer? Anybody? A couple of you? Okay, in Observer, you could build that filter very quickly. They allow you to build binary filters. I'm not going to teach you how to, how to build a binary filter today. But inside of Observer, tools, post filter, ah. Uh, Go to security. I got a bunch of those. Let me see if I've got one for that already. Nowhere. Nah, not in there. Anyway, the sink and an act. A lot of lot of filtering capabilities inside of Observer. New filter. I'm just gonna call it test because we're here. Plan. I never named filters test. I would slap myself for doing that, but since we're here, because I'll never know why I did it. So you know that lives in the TCP header. So I just go down here to IP dash TCP. Uh, keep going, keep going. Now. There we go. And you know that lives at offset what? 13? Sure, you all know that, right? 13 bytes over from the beginning of the TCP header. You're with me, man. I can tell. And you know that's a binary field. And it's a one and a... How many is that? Can you count? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. That all makes sense to you now? If you downloaded my spreadsheet, it would. Isn't that cool? You can even kind of do that in Wireshark. It's the same type of filtering. You're filtering for specific bits in the TCP header, the sync bit and the ACK bit. And then you can apply that filter and, you know, all the magic happens. Maybe. I can't get out of that. Man, it's broke. Control. Okay. And okay. And now I have a filter called test that we're going to delete. Ta da. All right. So, Wireshark, again, we can, we can filter with inside of Wireshark. We can also filter with inside of Observer. Two protocol analyzers. There's lots of protocol analyzers out there. Those are the two that I use. Most common. Uh, there's NetMiner. Uh, it's not really free. There's ColaSoft. So whatever your favorite analyzer is. Again, Wireshark is free. Sync Act Filter. We just talked about that. How you can find uh, worms, Trojans. Also, another way is Top Talkers inside of Wireshark. Trojans and worms tend to send a lot of small packets. So if you filter by packets, not big packets, think about doing file transfers, right? We're going to send 
large packets, lots of data in that packet. FTP might be a way to look for those big files leaving your environment, right? But Trojans looking for small. And in this case, I've also downloaded the information that shows you where, who's, you know, talking to wherever. Wow, look at all that. China, 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 Hong Kong. So it's even got all of the GOIP information that you can load into your Wireshark. Look at your top talkers and see who's sending data to you or who you're sending data to. China might not be good, just saying. Unless they're building cars that they're going to import over for, for us here soon. So again, we keep talking about the packet. Path of the packet is important. Obviously, we want to capture on your internet interface. That's the most important, important, important. That's Jethro talk there from Iowa. The most important point in your environment. But there are also other strategic places depending upon how your network is configured. How many of you have heard of packet brokers like Gigamon, Ixia, Garland? Okay, so with the use of those technologies as well, you can bring in multiple points from your network into one capture appliance that you're going to build now with T-Shark in my little batch file, potentially for free. But capturing all the packets, it's kind of important. So there are companies that make hardware solutions to do this, and there are companies, you know, that offer the free stuff. And so, again, I'm not here to sell you anything. I'm here to educate you. Gigastore is one of those hardware solutions. Riverbed makes a, a product with Wireshark called the NetShark appliance. So these are these big boxes, lots of terabytes worth of storage that you can go back in time. And again, you want to make sure if you're, you know, if you're capturing on a 10 gig link or a 40 gig link, my little batch file on your 386 machine isn't going to keep up, just so you know. All right. Didn't want there to be any misunderstanding there. So log files, again, it's not possible nor probable to go through, you know, a terabyte worth of packets. Not in my lifetime, not in your lifetime. So we want to use log files, net data, these kinds of things for smoke alarms to let us know something's going on. I've got, you know, this source talking to that destination and it shouldn't be. So there's my smoke alarm. Now I can go back into the terabyte system I've got, who's talking to who, I've got the time that happened, what ports, whatever, and I can now easily filter for that out of all of those, that packet information. And again, we just talked real quick there about, you know, NetFlow, a lot of great information that it keeps for you. Source, destination, source port, destination port, what protocol is in use, the timestamps, so now I know what time this event indicator of compromise occurred. I can now go back into my free T-Shark that I just built or my Gigastore or my NetShark appliance or whatever that box is that, that you're going to use to capture all of these packets. Again, log files from your firewall. In this case, I do allow FTP because people upload traces to me to help them analyze because a lot of people get free Wireshark and then they take the trace and they go, hmm, looks good. I don't know. Maybe we should ask Mike. So I say, sure, FTP me the trace. I don't allow anonymous. So you got to get the user and password and then I shut it down the minute we're done. And just again, within a week, you can, or a day, you can see the loggers at a week. I don't even remember. Today, 73, and then by the week, 1,700 attempts to break in. Dirty dogs. So again, looking at the log file, you can see what they're trying to access, what the ports are, source port, destination port, protocols. Oh, yeah, my favorite, somebody trying to get in on port 23. We already talked about that today. So somebody looking to see if Telnet's running on my server. So I gave you my statistics earlier. Here's where they came from, again, by country. I just looked at the IPs, did a little NS lookup or NeoTrace, whatever your favorite tool is to, to find all that stuff. And we can figure out who those attackers are by country. Again, the ability to go back in time, those big terabyte type boxes, there's many companies that make those. 
If you need one, contact one of those companies. But you need to have it in place ahead of time so that you can go back in time when they get in. How many of you ride motorcycles? You ever fell over on it? You know what I'm saying? You have, because you ride a motorcycle. Usually people go, no, I've never laid it down. You will. That's just part of riding, right? It's the same with being attacked. They ain't got in yet. So you think, they will. They're looking for that chink in your armor. They're going to find it because, you know, either you're not. But if you've got the packets, you can prove and see what they did, what they touched. So have it in place ahead of time. Again, the tool allows you to then roll back the time to, you know, whatever point in time you need to go to. Pull out the packets of interest for your indicator of compromise and do the analysis. So how much is enough? I don't know. Till I can't stand up anymore. I'm kidding. <laughs> Sometimes. It depends. We're talking banana whiskey or just whiskey whiskey. No. So <laughs> I'm kidding. How much is enough? It's all about... How far back in time do you need to go? I have companies that I work with, they need 30 days of retention. That's a lot of space. So, you know, it's up to you. I can't make that. We're back to Smokey, right? Smokey the Bear. Only you can make that decision based on your environment. We've talked about packet slicing and, and what's the trade-off. So, again, we can be sure the attack is imminent. Look at your firewall logs. They're trying. Every day they're trying. They're programming. They want to find that chink in your armor. So we want to be familiar with the flows and the patterns. You want to know what's different. And I always tease with a packet trace. Everybody says, you know, we use filters to find the needle in the haystack. I'm even lazier. Filter out the hay. What do you got left? Needles. It's definitely easier to find one needle among 10 than the needle in the haystack. So your call, whatever you want to do, however you want to do it. But I always encourage you filter out the haystack and let's get down to the needles. So the way that's going to work for you is you got to know what's normal. You got to have baselined the network sort of know what's normal. So some of you, you're going to have to work with your network peers and I know we all hate that, right? But it's the way it is. So you got to know what's normal. Protocols, application protocols are right on top of these. Your remote locations, what applications ride there. Again, what's normal. And then after the compromise, because again, it's like riding a motorcycle. It's going to happen. What was compromised? So inside your firewall, actually, this is outside your firewall. Do you have a web presence? If yes. Where are your web servers? What type of content do they host? Do you offer HTTP, HTTPS? Your little cool tool. What was it? I wrote it down because I'm like, Shodan. Shodan. Kind of give us that information very quickly. What are the functions? Do you have externally accessible FTP servers? Do you allow anonymous? Enough said if you do. Uh, we always recommend SSH, right? There you go. What kind of authentication, user ID and uh, password, two-factor? Do you allow uploads, downloads, both? How many hosts on your network? I'm not going to read all this to you. Take a picture if you want it or email me. I'll send you the slideshow. How do they get updates? All this good stuff. You need to baseline. If you do not know what's normal, how do you know when they got in and... They're exfiltrating an 11 gig file. Is that normal? I don't know. I did not baseline. So I'm going to encourage you. You have to know what's normal. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this information out. A couple of good traces, a little bit of time, and you can come up with what is normal. And again, this needs to be updated. Baseline information is kind of, in my world, a living document because, you know, your network and applications and all that isn't static. It changes every, I don't know, day, week, month. So as things change, you need to then re-validate, vindicate. Did you see V for vendetta? All those V words. That is dead on you. Vindicate, validate. You need to encourage 
everyone to be a part of this so that you know what is normal. So then you can look at the who, what, when, where, and where did they get to. So here's a little example out of my network. I showed you that FTP is allowed into my environment. I had somebody trying to get in. They sent a sync request. Dirty dogs. What did my host reply back with? A reset. I'm kidding. So then I GOIP'd him. I'm like, so who's trying to get into my FTP server at this particular time? India. It's okay. They're looking. I'm just saying. They're looking. I think it was you that talked about the honeypot. Was that you? Yeah. Honeypots. They're wonderful. Be careful. Honeypots. So again, filter out normal. If you know what's normal, it's easy to filter out the normal and see what you got left. That's remember I said filter out the hay. That's your normal. If I know, you know, I got subnet X of servers, web servers, we'll filter all those out. I know that's my normal traffic talking to this subnet group. So filter that out. Now, who else are those web servers talking to? Should they be? I don't know. I guess you'll find out. Again, it's easier to filter out the hay and find the needle among the needles than my favorite that you always hear people say, nah, just find a needle in the haystack. Good luck. I live on 30 acres. Have you seen some of those haystacks? We just bailed hay on my property. Try to find a needle in one of those. Any of you, you know, farmers, hay people, you know what I'm talking about. We just talked about sinks and sink acts. So I encourage you, perimeter defenses, you need to port scan your perimeter. Again, you know, you can pay somebody to do this, but why not learn to use the tools yourself? I encourage you to do that as well. Perform your own penetration test vulnerability scan. There's tools out there that'll do it for you. Find your weaknesses and vulnerabilities before they do, because they're looking and they will, guaranteed. Again, look for abnormal outbound data transfers. I can't stress that enough. There's no magic to how they're getting this information out of all these companies, right? They get in and they just send out all of these records. They don't send them out one at a time. They zip them up. They put them in a big RAR file. They FTP them. They whatever. They're moving a big block of data someplace that probably is not normal to your environment. So... What were the attack indicators? I've heard several of the speakers talk about indicators. What was penetrated and compromised? How long did the compromise persist? You know, they've been in your environment for two weeks, 30 days, 60 days. I don't know, there was some number I read. I read so many numbers, but there was some number I read not long ago that the average attack lasts, or they've been in your network for over 60 days, and you may be able to answer that better than I. Now it's 180. Wow. Wow. So they're, you guys are figuring it out faster. That's good. So how long, and then what information did leave your environment, and at what specific time of day? What devices were compromised? How did they get in? The most easy is a user ID and password. That's typically kind of what they're looking for, and especially on those admin shares, like Petya, WannaCry. Have you seen how the, well, somebody did one of those here already, how that all works. They were looking for admin shares and, uh, or admin and IPC dollar shares to be open. So again, what were the methods they used to exfiltrate the data? Can you put countermeasures in place to keep that type of compromise from happening again? You need to gather as much information as possible about the attack, present factual data. I can't tell you how many meetings I've been in where they think things, I think. I don't want you to think. I need facts, I need hard facts. We need to be able to present this case. What was monitored? How was the compromise detected? That's your eyeball. How did you detect it? That was in one of his seven kill chain things, detection. And you need to notify management. You can't sit on your hands when this kind of stuff happens. You need to notify management immediately. Clearly document 
the attack and compromise, what was compromised, the severity, how many servers, what servers, what hosts, what network hardware, my favorite Cisco. <laughs> and tell them that's open on all those devices, really? Network hardware, all this stuff is internet facing. Uh, what were the credentials used? If possible, can you, you know, change all that? Save logs and capture files. I encourage you to learn the tools. This is just a short list of tools. There's lots of tools, but for your network documentation piece, Nmap, Nessus, Nexpose, Kali Linux, everybody's talked about that. The old Metasploit, Burp Suite. Our man over here was talking about that earlier, Burp Suite. Uh, web Auditing and Attack Framework, the W3AF. Land Turtle, that's kind of a cool little USB Ethernet. People come in and plug that into the back of a PC and all of a sudden they've got access. Super Scan, Port Scanners, IP Scanners. Again, a lot of those are free tools. So you don't want Magic Mike walking into your network with his Wireshark and Land Turtle. You know what I'm saying? So what can you do about it? Nothing. I'm kidding. Kind of. Kind of. I'm kind of. I'm kidding. Configuration management. Patch as soon as practical. Again, a reason, the reason a lot of this information that that tool he showed you earlier was these are systems that are unpatched. There are still devices, SQL devices that are sitting out there that are unpatched. There are all kinds of things that are out there unpatched. Again, follow up on your vulnerability scanning. Once you've put in the patches, make sure they're, they're no longer vulnerable. Document the exceptions, communicate, communicate, communicate. I can't stress that enough. Uh, again, no tolerance for me, unauthorized users to come in and plug into your environment, especially Wi-Fi. I mean, I can't tell you how many places just eh, get on the Wi-Fi. It's part of your corporate network? Yeah, really? Okay. Yeah, whatever. Let me fire up my Wireshark with Wi-Fi mode. Sit at the airport and do that. Be careful. Identify security threats through packet analysis. Again, I have lots and lots of filters, and I would be more than willing to show you a few if you want at the end of this. Ensure you have all the packets. Magic Mike's rule here is... Garbage in, garbage out. I get the whole frame slicing thing. I understand that, you know, we're trying to save disk space, whatever. But if you don't have all the packets and you don't have all the information, you can't tell the whole story. Again, if you can't see all the paths, how do you know you have all the information? So we want to look at any place that there is inbound and or outbound access. And again, packet brokers, there's lots of these on the market from very inexpensive ones to very expensive ones, depending upon, you know, what is your need and what do you want those packet brokers to do for you? They can filter, they can aggregate, and now you've got 24 by 7 network visibility. So that's my presentation. You good? We're going to talk Wireshark. Anybody got any Wireshark questions? I kind of know it eh, a little like you? No? Sure. Hit me. Are, are you the guy that does the, I'm trying to remember this. <laughs> do, do you count the <laughs> That is me. Okay. Yeah. That is me. <laughs> you, you need a re remedial lesson? Is that the reason you're asking? It's like a one-minute remedial lesson? I, I can if you all, you got the time. If you got the time, I got the beer. Do it. Do it. <laughs> Okay, and so with that intro, that's how I came up with this. A good friend of mine, the guy that kind of started that Excel spreadsheet, came to me one day and said, man, I'm struggling with packet stuff. If you teach me all this packet stuff and hex stuff and binary and frames, I'll teach you. He was a cyber cop at the time for the bomb-making company in Kansas City that made the non-nuclear parts for nuclear weapons. Sure. Anyway, so he came to me one afternoon, and I said, sure. We sat down in my garage, in my garage, because at the time we both drank and we both smoked, and the first of that is the key. So after six of my favorite beers, I grew up right down the street from Coors, so you can already picture silver bullets flying. 
I looked down at my hands and I said, oh my gosh, there it is. You got the best hex calculator there is. Eight bits. Right? A byte is eight bits. One, two, four, eight. One, two, four, eight. Oh, he's got to adjust it. Ah, see, here we go. Finger netting. So one, two, four, eight, eight. You learned this in first grade. What does eight plus four plus two plus one equal? Fifteen. But that's two digits. We can't have two digits, right, that represent that in hex. So what do we do when we get to eight plus two? That's ten. Uh-oh. Now we're hosed. No, that's where the A comes from, right? That's the Canadians. A. Ah, bad joke. So there's A, B, C, D, right? E. Now I got to turn my back to you for this really to make sense. F, 10. That's it. And that's the secret of binary, decimal, and hex right there. If you can do that, subnetting, simple, excellent question. <laughs> Come to one of my classes and we'll have fun together. <laughs> Other questions? Sure. Yes, there are more than ACK and SYNAC and FINAL ACK. Would you describe since you're dealing with that with the types of responses? Because they're not just ACK and SYNAC. Oh, you mean the other types of scans? Yes, I mean, so um, we're seeing other packages that are not that. Sure, no, they're... Excellent, and I, I apologize. That's a, that's a great... Can I expand on the, the other? Sure. So the sync, first off, is the 2-bit. So now that you get the whole hand thing, right? So the sync is the 2-bit is set. So I send the sync. I expect a sync and an ACK back from you. That's sort of the beginning of that opening that session. You expect an act from me, and then we start our connection, and we move data, and then I send a pin when we're done, which is basically saying sayonara in Japanese, fin finished, and then you act, and we go through the you know four, three or four packets to tear down the session as well. So those are the normal process to start and close a connection in TCP. But from the perspective of scanning, using the TCP sort of header against you to scan to see what is there and, you know, can they evade techniques, firewall techniques, etc. They may set, instead of the sync, they may send an urgent bit or just an ACK or just a push bit or none of those bits set, all zero, that's a null, and see how does your server reply. What does it do? Does that answer your question? Is that kind of where you were going with this or where? Reset acts. Reset acts. You mentioned reset acts. I'm just repeating what you said. I was pretty no. I'm repeating what you just said. Reset acts. Reset acts. So typically the normal, let's talk about the normal, right? So the normal reason to receive a reset is I send a sync request to you, say on port 80. So I'm expecting to start a connection to what application? HTTP. But you're not a web server. You're the DNS server. Would you be able to sync act me back? No, if you did, that would be a whole other problem. So you would then send me a reset. You would act the, the receipt of my sync, and then you would send me a reset in that packet as well, saying, you know, no, I'm not going to open or start a connection with you. Because that port is not, that application service is not running on this particular server. And then there's, you know, window has to be zero. Sync, the sequence number must be zero. So, you know, there's some things that have to happen in that, that we can also vindicate with our Wireshark that, you know, the stack is doing what it's supposed to be. Good question. More? You want to keep going? I love this stuff. Ooh, retransmits. That's really, retransmits really isn't part of the hacking thing, but retransmits is part of the TCP process, sort of, I don't want to say fails, but I send data to you, 
And just a real easy scenario to show you this is I send data to you and I start a retransmission timer. I'm looking at my watch that doesn't exist right there. So you don't think I'm crazy. So I start my retransmission timer. I send the data, my timer expires and I didn't get your, your ACK back. So I'm gonna retransmit that data. So there's a retransmission timer for, for part of that process. There's also, see, selective acts. There's just so many things. I can't teach you TCP in three minutes as much as I would love to. But those are, those are excellent questions. Are we, are, are we good? Okay. Anyone else? Decrypting their own traffic, is that your question? Yes, many companies on the inside are decrypting their, you know, they're offloading today the encryption, decryption to, I hate to name vendors, load balancers, we'll just say that, right? There's lots of those, <laughs> lots of those. I won't pick on any of them. Uh, so typically those do the encryption and decryption so if I'm capturing on the backside of that where it's been decrypted, right, I can see all the application messages. If I'm capturing on the front side of that where it's encrypted, then I have the technique where we use the TCP data length. So I know data is being transferred and then I'm getting acts and there are data lists acts that are coming back from this, you know, whichever side of the device that's acting or there is acts with data as well. So I can't necessarily decrypt if I'm out on the other side of that without the key. Now, if I have the key, not if I have, if you have the key in that trace file, then yes, we can decrypt sometimes. I'm not gonna say all the time because it depends on, is it Diffie Hellman? There's other aspects to the whole decryption part of that, but that's an excellent question. Did I answer it okay? Okay. So we have devices set up on the outside. It's encrypted traffic coming in. It goes through your load balancer, and then in the next segment is where it is going inside. It's decrypted. Right. But it's coming from an IP of the load balancer. Is there things that sync up the packets or have one packet? You have to basically find the way to connect the outside traffic to the decrypted and, and make it match. There's no real... How much money do you have? Okay. So I'm, I'm not trying to be facetious. There are tools that, that can do that. But, you know, just with Wireshark, no. Okay. So that, that was my point of that. I mean, if you have money to spend, there are tools that we can, you know, if I can get a capture from, let's say, the client, even HTTP watch on the client. If you're running HTTP watch on the client, I can get the client, you know, the data before it gets encrypted from the browser, if we're talking a web application, and I can get it on the front end side, I can still kind of put things together and tell you that, well, this transaction is probably this TCP connection, but not with Wireshark. Does that answer your question? Right. This into the load balancer, you know. Right. And the load balancer won't give you the table of who's keeping track. Yeah, that's always the problem. But if you got lots of money, there are there are tools that can help you with that. And one of them, if you haven't heard of it, I'll just no, I, I was promised I wouldn't name tool. So there you go. <laughs> go to my website. You'll find it. It's out there. That's all I do is packet sniff. Is that uh, spreadsheet of all the tools and the batch files and stuff? Like that? It is, yeah. But the top kind of right hand side there where it says frame header, you know, we're gonna ask you for your email and all that stuff. You can just put in blah 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 blah, but you gotta put in a real email so we can email it to you. Uh, for those of you that weren't paying attention, I'm kidding. It's M N ex dot biz b i z that was a very good question by the way 
Pardon me? That frame No, you got to get it from the, the PC. Yeah. It's just too much info. Well, let me show it to you again on the big screen. On the big screen. Maybe. Uh, trying to not take over everybody else's time here. Right there. M N E X dot biz B I Z. If you look on the back of your page there, yeah, you can't hardly miss it. I'm down on the bottom left corner, I think. And if you can tell me what the binary is in, I won't test you. Okay, other questions? Have you done anything similar with IPv6? Or is that as far as 10 years in the future? Or, or as far as what? Training? And sniffing? And oh, got lots of IPv6, yes. Yeah. How does that factor into the similar treatment where you have to use totally different tools? No. No, no. Wireshark will capture IPv6. Uh, all those, all those tools will capture IPv6 packets. You know, IPv6 scares a lot of people, but if you can do hex, that's all IPv6 addresses are. It's just a bunch of hex, 16 bytes. So the header is 40 bytes instead of variable length. So there's from the packet perspective, IPv6 is not scary at all. Excellent question. Others? Done. Okay. Thanks for listening. <laughs>